Well, now, the children, you see, actually practically from birth, they are geared to work very hard towards taking certain <coughs> steps in independence. And in each, we, we spoke about the periods of uh, development and sort of birth to about six being the first period and then six to 11 and then 11 to 18. There were three main stages, which can be subdivided again, but those are the three main uh, stages. And during each of those stages, uh, the, uh, nature tells the child to take certain steps in independence. And independence, of course, when you have achieved a certain step in independence, does lead to freedom. I mean, once you can sit up, you can look around the room. Once you can crawl, you can get around the room. You see, once you can walk, you're not dependent on someone carrying you, or putting you in a chair, and you have to stay there. You see, so but all everything, so freedom always has to be worked for. And I think this is what we forget today. We just expect to be given freedom, and we don't uh, understand the, or think of the responsibilities that go with it, and the fact that it has to be earned. Now, in the first uh, period of development, uh, that there is very, very hard work going on. You see, the little baby has to practice and practice until his muscles are strong enough to uh, pull himself up into a sitting position. You see, uh, you've only got to watch them when they first try and crawl. You see, I was watching a baby not long ago and uh, doing his first bit of crawling and all he could do was shoot backwards. And you see, he, tried, he was trying to go forward and each time he tried, he went backwards at a terrific rate and there was this look of astonishment on his face. <laughs> but he went on trying and trying. And life must be very difficult, and they attack it with tremendous courage. You see, when you're going to learn to walk, how many times you fall over and give yourself really painful knocks, you see, and in a few minutes you're trying again, you see. Now we do must appreciate the efforts the children make, and the grown-up's part is to anticipate each step in development, to understand what is going to be achieved or what nature meant the child to achieve in the first six years and then in the next period and then the next and anticipate these steps and prepare the child as far as possible so that the transition is uh, more successful and is gone through happily instead of with difficult, too much difficulty. I mean, there's always got to be effort on the child's past part or the young person's part, but we can help them go through these steps smoothly and with a great feeling of success instead of the depression that they often end up with. And of course, if we are not careful, uh, we do as adults frustrate the little children because we are fearful for them. I think uh, we do tend to be a little over fearful for them at each stage of development. But if we are going to let the little ones do what nature is dictating to them, we are behind them to see that they don't do anything too dangerous. You see? Then they do um, go through life with this positive happiness and achievement, and they you get a very good product in the end. Hard on the mothers if they have to watch sometimes. Well, now... When the child is learning to walk, it's easy to see. Most mothers do the right thing. They stand a little, a very small distance, or they uh, kneel at a very small distance away from the child. They encourage the child. They laugh with the child, uh, and they catch him when he, he tumbles. You know, so that that is a very happy time for both of them. And all children are ready to work, walk at a certain stage when certain <coughs> physical development has taken place. It's not good to uh, start them too young because uh, the bones won't be ready and so on. Well now, what do they mainly do, you see, up to six years? They do uh, not only learn to walk, but they perfect movement. And we're always talking about this perfection of movement. 
and they perfect the movements of the hands so that by five, six years of age, a child may be walking beautifully, gracefully, able to climb and balance, you see, being real, real control of his body. Or he may be clumsy, fall over easily, and not to have very good balance. It depends very much on the experience he has been allowed. His hands may be very well developed by five to six. He may be able to use and most of the tools well, or be able to use any new tool well, be ready to write well, because his hands have had the right preparation, <coughs> or his hands may be very clumsy, and he may still be using that infantile grip on his spoon or his pencil. <coughs> you see, it will very much, it would entirely depend on the help he's been given in his development by the adults. So there is this, and remember that any use of the movement, and especially the use of the hand, does stimulate the intelligence and the development of the intelligence. So therefore, there, there will be that to take into consideration. Now then, what else does he do? He uh, learns to adjust to the society in which he lives. He learns the conventions of the group in which he finds himself. And in our world, of course, uh, these are very, in, I think in practically every uh, group of people, there are quite complicated rituals of how you greet people or how you say goodbye to them and uh, all sorts of rituals connected with eating. You see, I think every group of people have these, uh, what you might call social manners. And so the child has to find his way in a maze of these and uh, adopt those that uh, belong to his group. Now, many of these, of course, uh, have their roots in very uh, uh, far off times so that we have forgotten why we do them. We've forgotten why we greet by shaking hands, you see, and so on. It's uh, still a convention that the man walks on the outside of the street because in the Middle Ages, streets were very dirty Everyone threw their rubbish into the streets, the carriages splashed you, and the man, very decently, always walked on the outside so that the woman was protected. I mean, the Western man has behaved very well, and uh, so he, he got splashed and she didn't. And then, on the other hand, you uh, usually uh, uh, held onto his left hand, left arm, because he had to be free to draw his sword with his right and in the days before there was a police force, you know. And it's very, it's very funny when you think of these things that we do without knowing why we do them. But they have persisted, and in the beginning they, there was a reasonable basis for all these mannerisms. And then every generation of young people partly rethinks the mannerisms of the group, and you find slight changes taking place. And, uh, Certain things get dropped and certain other things get developed. So, uh, you know, it's, it's always a, a, slight, a slightly changing society. And that's where the uh, sort of late t teenagers come in. They add to the language by inventing words and they change it, the society a little bit. And it's, but it's not happy if they change it too suddenly and go too far. So the child has to adapt to the social conventions of his group. He has to understand the morals of his group. And this is mainly by the example of the adults at first. We must talk more about that another time. Then he has to understand the world in which he lives and, and know how to act in it, how to use it, how to work in it. You see? And for the first six years, it's the world of the home, which uh, nature makes him concentrate on. And he needs to be in a very home-like situation if he's in a nursery school, so that in the nursery school, he can do those things which he would normally do in his own home with his own mother. And by nature, uh, says to the child, now uh, imitate the adult by doing whatever the adult does. 
So as soon as a child can toddle behind his mother, he tries to imitate what she does. He doesn't really want toys, but he would like to help stir the cake mixture. He would like to help wash up the spoons when she washes up. He likes to go around tucking in the bed with her, or whatever you do in your houses. And by doing things with his mother in this way, he begins to understand how his own environment works, and he prepares himself to be a worker within the environment. You see, And he feels independent. If there's a spoon missing uh, uh, on the table at a meal, it's the youngest one who loves to jump down and go and find it, showing that he knows where to get it, you see. And uh, this gives him great pleasure because he feels that he can begin to manage for himself. Yes. Well, now, if we're going to have the children in the nursery school, we must provide them uh, with the opportunities for studying their environment in this way. Now, toys do not satisfy them. If you don't, if you are not allowed reality, then a toy broom, you will fidget about with a toy broom. But you say to any child who's got a room full of toys, you see a, bit, a small child, would you like to help me make a cake? And they're with you in a twinkling, aren't they? They don't want to play with the toy stove, they want to come and do the real thing. So, first of all, the, all these things that we do are fairly complicated. And whenever you use new tools, then you have to learn the use of the proper use of the tool, or you do not make a success of whatever it is you want to do. If you want to uh, learn to do any carpentry, you have to learn to use a saw and a chisel and a screwdriver and a drill and a camp sink and so on. You have to learn the use of each tool. And that's quite tricky. And unless you learn the right handling, you'll never do the job well. If you want to cut out, you have to learn to use scissors. You see, again, a very difficult operation. Many things in the kitchen, you have to learn how you cut with a knife, which is the sharp side and which is the blunt side, you see, before you can really do anything very much in the kitchen. And you can't do anything with bad tools. It's no good giving a child a very blunt knife and expecting him to be able to cut a carrot. You wouldn't be able to do it yourself, so how can he? So if you do show him the right way to do anything, he then has to have a good tool, you see, a tool that really works. After all, everybody's going to cut a finger sometime, you know, and we don't have to be too worried about that because we just grow together again. He's not going to cut the finger off. And we must stop being, you know, we, we mustn't be overprotective. But we must show the right way to do things. Well then, we have to give him real tools, but if possible, ones that are a little smaller than our own, because it is difficult for a child to manage the bigger tools. And uh, I haven't succeeded in finding things as small here, in some cases, as I can find in England, but some things I've got are small enough for a child's use. But they must be real, and they must really work. They're not playthings. It's no good giving him a toy. He can't learn with a toy. And then the tools need to be attractive. And they need to be kept in an attractive manner in the schoolroom. You usually have one area where there is a, a sink with water, that, and you keep all the things for keeping the classroom in a good condition in that area. But they must be well kept clean, in good condition, and they must be as attractive as possible. After all, in our own kitchens, we like working if we have attractive tools. And the manufacturers know this, and if they want to sell us a vacuum cleaner, they're always making them of different patterns and different colors just to attract us to buy them. You know, we like to have a color scheme, and so on. And you're much happier working with a broom that is a color that you like 
than a broom that is a color you don't like. It's extraordinary what an effect this has. So then things must be attractive. Now, in setting up your classroom, you will have to make sure that you have uh, materials that need cleaning, you see, and that will furnish the child with all the exercises that he needs because he doesn't want invented exercises. When he does these exercises with such pleasure and works so hard to perfect himself at each point, he does want to feel that he is working. You see, just as a grown-up works, he, he wants to feel that he's really working and keeping the classroom nice, and he likes to feel that he's making it nice for everyone. So we must never say to a child, each child wash their own table, because this would be bad moral training. A child washes any table. At lunchtime, if there is our spoons and forks to be washed, one or two children wash all the spoons and forks. You see, they do not, you would never have each child washing their own. Because uh, we have to, as adults, work for the community. We are communal animals, we are not solitary animals, and each adult chooses the work that most appeals to him, uh, but work which is useful to, put to the community. And we are first members of a community. And when we find work we like, it is then that we are happy and mentally sane. Yes, yes, that is a fact. You, uh, our hospitals are full of people with nervous breakdowns. And the only cure is to find them work that they enjoy and feel useful in doing. It doesn't matter how simple, you know, as long as it is work that serves the community and work which they enjoy doing. And then they, they cure. And the cure is always work. <coughs> yeah. So we can cease rumbling about it so much. Now, naturally, uh, you, you must make a list of all the things you do in your own homes. If you think of the furniture, I'm sure you polish furniture, don't you? And you wash certain types, you have for, uh, certain types of washable surfaces which you just use a sponge and soap. And you have painted surfaces I don't know if you have plain wooden ones. We often have a plain wooden table which needs scrubbing or an area of floor that can be scrubbed. But therefore you must, you don't have everything is the same. You must have painted surfaces in the schoolroom. You have painted walls or painted cupboards. You must have some tables that need polishing. You see and some which need just washing. And I think you need at least one table which is plain wood and needs scrubbing, or else an area of something that can't be scrubbed. It could be shelves, it could be anything. But you must never show the child a wrong activity. I went into one Montessori school and there was one table kept for scrubbing purposes and it was painted green and the husband Oh, the woman who ran it said to me, I have to repaint that table about six times a year because the paint gets scrubbed off all the time. You see, well, that was a very wrong thing to do because you were training a child to do something which you would never, ought to, you would never do at home and which was completely wrong. He should have been washing the painted table because it was sponge and soap of some sort. You must do these exercises in an intellectual fashion. It is the most intellectual woman that need, makes a good home because that you, she does really need to study so many different things, especially today with all the different detergents and soap products that there are. And you do have to know <coughs> when, when to use soap and when to use detergent and when to use cool water and when to use hot water and so on. 
I'm always going into homes and finding people washing their good glass with a detergent. And if you want a good glass, or crystal as it's called, has a certain amount of lead in it which gives it the sparkle. And if you wash that with detergent, the lead is melted out by the detergent and you end up very quickly with glass that looks like old plastic. It absolutely ruins your cut glass or your crystal, as I'm sure not many of you know. And, uh, no, but well, now you do. <laughs> you know, and it is really, you know, you get a bit of beautiful cut glass and you've seen cut glass which has lost that sparkle very often today. So, we have to know, we have to keep ahead of the manufacturers because they will put glass on the packet. You see, but it, it is not a fact. So, whenever you show a child an exercise, you also have to show it very meticulously and for many exercises, he needs a preparation, you see, before he can do very much in a, a kitchen. There are little exercises he can do, learning how to use the different pieces of equipment. He can learn to use an egg beater, you see, in a bowl. That is something they like doing. He can at first have a knife that isn't too sharp and cut soft things like a banana or melon. There are some things which are not too hard. And then when he's using that fairly successfully, <coughs> then he can have a sharper knife and scrape carrots and cut them up or prepare any sort of vegetables. You see, we cut quite hard things. I think we mustn't always take a banana into the classroom, you know, we must think of different things for him to cut. No, or not, not always the same carrot, you know, because there are other vegetables like radishes and that you can vary from day to day what you take into the classroom. They like uh, cleaning these and cutting them up and handing them round and everybody eats carrot or banana or whatever and they become more, more skillful in the use of a knife. Then uh, I find you have a very nice little thing for sifting flour. You say on the handle. You have one in your kitchens, do you? Well, the child would love to have flour to sift, you see, and begin to and then there's a gadget for making uh, lemon balls you know, that you have. <coughs> they would enjoy using that some days, you see. You know, you may, you, do you use this only for the melon, or do you use it? Hmm? It's only for the melon, is it? Butter balls. Oh, butter balls. <laughs> I think the melon might be better. Yes, well, when he can do the melon well, <laughs> then perhaps you can have better balls. <laughs> oh, I'm used to those two boards that you roll your butter on. Don't you have those? We have wooden boards with the crisscross marking, and you roll your butter balls and roll them any shape, but they get a nice pattern on them. Uh, children love using them. This, this would be easier, but not so pretty, the result. Then you, as a teacher, can take in a fairly simple biscuit mix, you know, and the children can have uh, little boards and rolling pins, small rolling pins, and they can roll it out and cut it out with a pastry cutter. We can get uh, quite small pastry cutters and arrange the finished product on a baking tin so that they uh, could be cooked at home or if there's a kitchen at school, the teacher, someone could cook it for them. I don't think really you can have a, a, any cook form of cookery in the classroom because, I mean, it, it is, uh, you can't really watch anything where the children might burn themselves. Wouldn't be allowed by law with us anyway. But uh, the children can do all the preparation. 
And I mean, if pieces go on the floor and get picked up and rolled out again, or they roll the same piece over and over until it gets so black, you know, never mind, push it on the baking tin, you know. You don't necessarily have to give them that one. <laughs> but then the next day, you see they can hand those round, or when they are cooked, they like to have them to hand. <coughs> don't get children to mark their own. That again is teaching this bad social behavior. When they have made them, they all put on a plate and they're common property. We must be very careful what we do with little children and think where we're going when we train them to these more selfish habits. Well, after a time, you can make the recipe in front of them. And then, between four and five years of age, uh, you remember the Barak tablets that we spoke about? We had the, the weight tablets. Well, after using those, the children know something about weight. So the next step will be to bring a pair of scales into the classroom with loose weights and teach them to weigh things in ounces and pounds. How do you weigh here? We've gone into the decimal system. No. But no, a clock face scales are not really useful. You want the ones with the loose weights. If you are going into the decimal system, then you must take the have those. And the children love weighing things. And at first you take in a box of pre-packed groceries, like half a pound of beans or a pound of rice. They, they come in plastic nowadays. It's easy to take these things in. Most of the spices with us come in two ounce containers and so on. So the children like to have these things to weigh. See? Then they understand weight. And then you can show them, oh, but you don't weigh with scales, do you? We do. We weigh all our things in the kitchen with scales. And, and you use uh, cups and spoons, don't you? So I think they, they must learn to use the scales. You see. And you could show them how to weigh out a recipe. You see. But then you can also have the, your uh, cups and spoons and show them that measurement as well. And of course, uh, you, don't you show them how to uh, level it off exactly with a knife and so on. And they will love practicing that, you see, filling the spoons and just uh, measuring it off with a knife. Then before, it isn't so long before a five to six year old could make a, a simple recipes themselves. And nowadays, we don't expect very much of our children. But in primitive societies, by that age, the child would be really doing useful things, and his work would be needed. And in pioneering days, there were not many children of six to seven, seven to eight, who could make all the bread for the family. A friend of mine in England used to knit stockings by the time she was five and a half. You see, when I was in Peru, I saw oh, everybody walking around with a great bundle of wool under their arms and a drop spindle. And you'd see quite tiny children. I mean, they could seem, seemed to be almost unaware of it. They'd be walk, they were very fast walkers, and all the time they would be just spinning this wool. You see. And, the, and the small children were doing it and being of use in the community, you see, which gives them a feeling of, uh, of being people, being important. Whereas we treat them as though they were of no importance. And I think that's what's hard for our children to grow up getting this uh, conscious feeling of worth because we always treat them as though their worth was of no use to us. In Africa, the, where the women get water from a stream and carry it home in a pot on their head, you know, as soon as a child can toddle behind the mother, the mother puts something on the child's head, a leaf or a stick or something. And every time it falls off, she puts it back. And then by about two, two and a half, three, the child is walking with a little pot of water and bringing it home safely, you see. Because again, it's a useful contribution. And uh, therefore you do feel yourself of importance. You know, not consciously, but you know you've got some worth in the community. Well, now, anything like that, then? 
and they can begin making different recipes. Of course, cooking is something they love doing. There are a certain number of things you can make uh, that don't require cooking. I think, um, Ms. Blodgett, you have some, don't you, Marilyn? Some recipes you could give people that, that they can make their own snacks. You have some, do you, that you make? It would be useful if you wrote them up for people. These are recipes that you can make, that children can make without having to cook them. The things you can make with ground nuts and things. Well, another thing that the child needs to do is to learn to pour. Where they will be wanting to pour out the milk or the juice that they drink or water. And if, you, if they have a meal, then at the meal, one child pours out the water for everyone. If you have a snack time, then one child pours out the juice for everybody. So first of all, they must learn how to pour, and that's a difficult operation. And first of all, when the children are sort of two, two and a half, we have a tray with two little jugs, and we show them how to Instead of pouring water, at first they pour something like cornmeal or rice or barley, something that doesn't make so much mess as water. And you have to show them to bring one jug just above the other, and not letting the uh, lip of the jug touch the thing you're pouring into, and then tip the jug very slowly so that you pour. But you have to de demonstrate that very clearly. Tell them. Just this one just doesn't touch that one. See? And then pour. Now we don't always give them plastic because they must have breakable things in the score room. Otherwise, they never learn that things break. You see, and they drop them, and it doesn't matter. I always remember a small nephew staying with me, and he had only had plastic in his home. He was pretty young, and we were having uh, orange juice out of glasses, and he dropped the glass, and it broke. And he was thrilled. So, oh, he'd never seen anything break. It was a moment of real discovery. And he caught hold of me. He wasn't really talking, and he just showed me, you know, all of this stuff. And then, just to show me what really happened, he picked up another. <laughs> and he was so thrilled that you couldn't stop him. You know, he broke six glasses. <laughs> just demonstrated. They were not very precious glasses, but it was such a moment of wonderful discovery. That uh, glass had that property. But after that, he, he was most careful. He never broke anything again. He was quite upset when you found, found you couldn't put them together again. <laughs> and then you see, then when you've gone so far and you pour the rice successfully, then you can pour water see, into another jug. Stopping it without drips or into glasses for the other children. And a child will sit and practice that just sitting at a table, uh, enjoying pouring one thing into another, something they really like doing, but all the time he's learning how to manage his environment. They also like a jar and a funnel, you see, and to pour water into a jar, and it can be a measuring jar, so that he can measure a pint or a port, half a pint. How are you measuring in gills, pints, quarts? And then he can learn those words too, you see. Well, he's going to learn to wash paint, you see, and, some t and to scrub. And then for the scrubbing, you need a small scrubbing brush and a sponge and a soap dish with a small piece of soap. These nice little scrubbing brushes. And you have to have a basin of water 
and <coughs> show him how to put the soap towards on the brush after it's wet, or rubbing towards the basin, because if you rub this way, you get splashed, don't you? And then you have to show him how to wet the surface with the sponge, and then how to scrub in this hard, in this circular motion. Just getting the edges clean too, because they will scrub just one place in the middle. And then the, you do point out to them that there mustn't be any water on the floor. And they wear an apron. And very soon you teach them to stand so that they're standing about an inch away from the table so the front of their apron doesn't get wet. See, all these little points they need to be told. And then they have to rinse the table and squeeze and squeeze the sponge and get the table nice and dry. And last thing of all, they look at the floor to see if that's clean or not. That's, uh, that I find is the most popular of all, is the scrubbing of the table. I seem to love doing that. Now, uh, again, we must, I think, really look up uh, the exercises that we teach them so we make sure we're doing the thing correctly ourselves. And we must provide the right um, detergent or the best thing for washing paint or whatever. But at the same time that we provide these things, we must be careful to read the directions and make sure that none, uh, nothing toxic is put in the, in the classroom. It will always say it is toxic. And paint, you have to start at the bottom and wash upwards. You see. And some days, where if you have a morning that is not going really very well, you can put everything away and have a sort of spring cleaning day, and everybody cheers up at once. You know, move the cupboards and sweep behind them and wash the walls all together. And uh, you, in no time, you've got happy children. Then all the different containers they have. What a lot of different containers we have. They have to, you can have some empty ones, like the bottles, you see, but, so that they have to unscrew a top. They love to have a collection of containers that need a, to be, have a screw top, an unscrewed top, or corks that take in and out, or the ones that push up and push down, you see. Bring the em some empty containers in so that they can practice just on managing the container. Our world is so complicated. They have to learn all these things individually, and they will sit and practice something like that very, very happily for a long time, you see, because uh, they do need to conquer their environment. Now, supposing you were going to give them uh, any lesson, some of the lessons can be given as group lessons. If you were going to polish the silver you use, or polish any brass, of course, the silver must be uh, stuff that is used by the class, or the brass must be something that is used in the classroom. You don't put one thing in a box and expect them to polish it. They only want to polish them if they are things that are in real use. With us, we, uh, our door handles are often brass, and we do have a fair number of things like vases or bells. I haven't done walking on the line with you yet, but there we have a lot of brass bells that we use, and the children have polished them. But there you need uh, little squares of uh, cloth, like uh, cotton. I mean, you can use old, old uh, clothes and things to tear into small squares. You put the um, polish on with, and uh, rather slightly larger squares of something like uh, bit fluffy like a woolen material <coughs> to uh, polish them off with. You see. And you always uh, have, your, if this was a thing of brass polish, with us it's called brass, so I don't know what it's called with you. It's brass, so is it. You always read the directions, however small the children are. You get them used to doing these things intelligently. And so you have the bottle and you read anything in red first, because you know, if it should say, do not use in front of an open flame, you explain that to the children. See? Oh, it's all right in this classroom because we don't have an open flame fire. See? 
Now, you have no idea how many accidents there are every year because uh, women just don't read the directions on the fluids, or men either. A very, a house, a very good house opposite friends of mine a couple of years ago went up in flames because the young man had left his tin of petrol outside in the sun and then brought it into the kitchen where there was a gas burner, you can see. And it was a very hot day, and petrol's volatile, and the whole thing went up in flames, and a house worth about 50,000 burnt down. <coughs> and and you, you, you would have thought anyone who could ride a motor, motor bicycle would know a thing like that. And it's not always us, but often is. So you read any directions like that. Then it, another thing in red, it will say, shake well. Now you have to show the children the top must be screwed on nice and tight. You have to put one finger on the, the stopper and hold, the, hold it like this so that the stopper can't fly off while we're shaking and then have to shake really vigorously. Now, I've often found that I didn't get beyond that stage of the lesson <laughs> because everybody was so bent on just shaking the bottle. And for a little while, I had to have two or three of these containers. You know, for the children just to sit and shake, you know, because it just anything new like that and catches their interest. And then you read to them how to apply it, how to rub it off. And I think with brass, you have to rub it off after the brass is dry. I always forget. With the silver, it's the opposite. You have to rub it off while it's still. And so then you proceed to show them how to wrap the top around their finger and hold it and not very hard in every area of the brass. And it's very nice sort of community work, you know, certain children like to sit round a table and do it all together. Now again, you show them care of the environment. We spread the table with newspaper first or something protective. We all wear aprons, we all roll up our sleeves, you see, so that uh, we learn to do a job without creating a couple more jobs. And then, once you have shown them, and you will have to re-demonstrate more than once, of course, they probably want to do it every day for a little while once they're intrigued with it, then the materials can be kept in the classroom so that a child could help himself to the glass cleaning, get anything he wanted to clean, and to do the exercise himself. So once you've really practiced it with the children, then the exercise remains in the classroom. So you polish brass, they polish silver in very much the same way, don't they? If you're going to polish a mirror, of course, they do sell you the stuff right nowadays. The best thing really is just soap and water. But it should be a mirror that, again, is used by the children. In the cloakroom, you must have a full-length mirror and perhaps some smaller ones so the children in dressing themselves can see if that time. And uh, perhaps you would uh, need one in the classroom if they're going to put on their coats there. And it should be the mirror that's used, not just one imported and kept in a cupboard. You can, I think you can get, you see here's a little mop, it is a real one. Now, how do you you how do you you here use this mop? How do you squeeze it out when it's wet? With your hands? Or a mop bucket. You, you do have mop, but you have mop bucket. Yeah. Yes, those those are much better, aren't they? We would have a mop bucket with a, a section with something like a funnel with holes in, and they just love squeezing it out in that. And then we have. Uh, uh, the, the sponge mops, which have uh, something in the handle, which uh, is self-squeezing. You push the lever down and it, uh, the sponge squeezes itself. You have those? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, the ones that are very nice for use in the classrooms are ones about this size, which are really meant for cleaning windows. But they make very nice floor mops for the children. Your American broom is quite different to our English broom. Our English broom is... Um, has a handle in it, a slant. Uh, I'm, I'm going to show you a picture of it in the catalogue. And it's made of hair. 
and it does a very good job. I, I didn't recognize the broom when I, when I first came here. I went to store after store looking for a broom and <laughs> never succeeded in finding it. So I didn't recognize what was offered to me. <laughs> that, uh, something like that we would use in the yard. It doesn't seem to me to do an awfully good job. <laughs> And, of course, the, the yard is part of the environment. So the children can also, especially on, in nice weather, they like to sweep up the yard. They like to rake up the leaves in the autumn. They like to cut off the dead leaves and the dead flower heads. See, so they can learn the care of the yard as well as of the classroom. It's all part of the home environment. If you give them scissors, it must be scissors that really cut. And uh, the, the best thing is something about the thickness of Christmas cards. I find Christmas cards very useful because, and you show them to ha open the scissors and have the paper at, and scissors at right angles to each other. Because if you have hold your scissors sideways, they often slip on them and don't cut. <laughs> and at first, the child would only want to be so busy learning to manage the scissors that he just cuts the paper into little bits, you know. And when he's managing them fairly well, then you give him a picture <coughs> with a square outline and show him how to cut the line, you know. And then a picture with a curved um, frame and he can learn to cut through a curve. But it's a difficult thing to learn this you know, skillful cutting. So he does need a sort of series of little exercises to uh, enable him to really cut well. And once you've shown him how to cut, <coughs> you do keep a box of pictures for Christmas cards, what you have, and some good scissors. And again, he will help himself to that at any time and sit and cut very happily. And from time to time, he'll need another lesson in cutting. They were like arranging flowers. They do have a variety of vases. You see, and bring in of course, it's very nice if they can pick their own flowers, wild ones as well as uh, the bought ones. And then, before they arrange, put the flower in the bars that you, they need to cut half an inch off the stem and the flowers will last longer. Of course, they get so enthusiastic that they cut half inches up the stem until there's only the head left. So you need to have one or two of those floating. <laughs> But it's been good practice in cutting. <laughs> well, what else can you think of? The, the, you don't, I don't know if you have a meal. With us, if children stay all day, they always have a cooked meal in the middle of the day. They don't bring their own lunch. And that's such a nice time because one or two children wear a little white apron and set the table. See. And then um, sometimes they do the handing round as well. And there's always something on the table like uh, rusks or lettuce that they can, children can hand round to each other. And then the teacher serves the food, giving more to the child she knows is hungry and very little to the poor eaters. But a lot of children come to school because they won't eat at home and uh, they begin to develop a good appetite at school. One way is to give them very, very small helpings, but let them have as many helpings as they like. Uh, our most successful way was always to sit the next to a very good eater. Uh, my partner had a good appetite, and if they should, so we would sit them next to her, because the <laughs> staff sit with the children, and they, you know, all eat together. And if a child sit, would begin to say, mm, I don't like cabbage, you know, she would say, Ooh, can I have it? <laughs> she never waited till the child to say yes. She whisked it off his plate on her own. And if he said, I don't like this meat, ooh, I'll have it. <laughs> and you know, in two to three days, that child would be sitting there, <laughs> protecting his plate <laughs> and warping his food. It was really successful.
And, uh, and then uh, Ralph, then he was ready, they do ready, ravenous thing. Right? And then if there was something they really didn't like, you don't give it them at first, but when you have a good relationship to a ch with a child, you can say, oh, I think you'd better eat just this tiny bit and begin to eat some of it, you know, and they're always eating. I mean, you start them with a very, very small bit indeed, but they will always begin to eat it for you. So they begin gradually to eat anything. Then after the meal, it's, the waiters then have theirs, and two or three other children clear away and wash the silver. Or if that's a little older, wash everything up and dry it and put it away. But nobody ever serves themselves. Nobody ever lays just their own place. There's always a few who do it for everybody else. It's a, about the most popular thing there can be, so they, uh, there's no problem about that. But it's a community work. And you're not going to teach this. It is more difficult with you because each child eats his own uh, lunch there. Very much nicer if it was all were put into a community project and everybody had some of it. That might, that's more difficult, I expect, to arrange. Use of some tools. <coughs> you see, they ha love to have a collection of nuts and bolts that they can screw and unscrew. Sometimes these are done by hand, and sometimes uh, then the next thing would be to let them have a spanner to use. If you have different sizes, they either have a spanner with different holes or else an adjustable spanner. They love an adjustable spanner. So they. Well, um, I don't think hmm? I don't think so. Because to have an iron hot enough, a child could burn themselves. And I don't think the teacher can supervise that if she has a lot of children. I think that's something you can do with a child in the home. But under five, you know, they are very young, aren't they? But washing of uh, different cloths they can do. I mean, they do love to wash the dusters, or they do love to wash their little aprons. And that, once they've had the fabrics, which you've had, haven't you? Then they learn the names of the different fabrics. And then, if you have different things to be washed, like a woolly duster or a cotton cloth, you can get them to sort these into the different kinds, and you teach them the right way to wash wool or the right way to wash cotton. You know, the different temperatures or the different uh, detergents you use. And that's, a, again, so anything to do with water they like, don't they? <coughs> It's hard for them to learn when everything goes into a washing machine at home. But you do really need to understand uh, this hand washing before you use a washing machine, or you will spoil your things. And then here is a, a really nice wall <laughs> that looks workman like. You see, it's got round headed screws and some fat top screws, and a nice, you see, that's just about a child's size, a nice sturdy screwdriver, and they just love screwing and unscrewing these screws. And it's been screwed in quite tightly. See, they can take the screws out and they can screw them in again. Then by four years of age, they can be learning to use a hammer and nails. And at first, all they want to do is have a selection of nails and a good block of wood. And possibly you let them do that outside. It's a bit noisy for the classroom, but you show them the proper way to use a hammer. Small hammer, but it's got to be heavy enough. You can't have the one that's too light. And they will spend hours very happily learning to hammer nails. And then they can learn to saw wood, saw to a line, but they must do that in a vice, uh, if, uh, because otherwise the saw could easily slip and they could have an accident. So you must have a, a little carpentry bench and a vice. 
and then they can uh, and they can also learn to make drill drill holes again keeping the piece of wood in a vice and countersink see and then before they're five they can be making small models I mean they often put pieces of wood together for their own satisfaction you know saying it's an airplane or a car or something but you can also show them uh, some simple models very easy to make a simple model of a ship with a deck and a funnel they're cutting the funnel from a tower. I was wondering about that, of letting them make, you know, like little cars or little boats, and showing them, you know, for example, how to use doweling to... Yes, that's what I was saying. You can make a very simple boat, you know. Yeah. Um, you can make a very simple boat. Yeah. Um, and you can make a very You can make a very simple boat. 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 You can make a and then they make the deck with a square rod thick wood and they hammer it on with four nails. And then uh, with the uh, this bit of the right size, they can make the hole for the funnel at a slight slant. You see, and cut the funnel from a dowel. And then hope you just hope it'll float. <laughs> If they make it, they make them various sizes, and that may be big enough for two funnels. Yeah. They like doing that. The car is a little more difficult, but they can. The next thing they can do is a very simple car, yeah. in that sort of way. So uh, there's no doubt that they... I usually um, have the carpentry classes in groups, because at first, you need to help them a good bit with the tools. But uh, if they have first learned to use a screwdriver and learned to use a hammer and nails, which they can do by themselves when they're shown, you see then it isn't so much to go on to the sawing and the countersinking and so on. So would you mean you teach that in a group, or do you teach them individually? These things you can teach individually. But if you're really going to make, every child's going to make a little ship, and they're really going to use the saws and things and plane. I think usually then I've had it in a group. Do you teach them how to use the saw? Yeah, I would use the, teach these things individually. And at first when they learn to use these small saws, uh, it has to be a real saw. On the whole, I've had that as a group so that I can keep an eye on people. You know? Because... Uh, you can hurt yourself if you use the saw badly, you know. And I saw a horrible picture in one of our educational papers when a child, he must have been about six, but he was left-handed and he had a tenon saw in his left hand and rather a thick dowel which he was holding on the table like this, and he was sawing down like this. And really, I mean, whoever took the photograph and whoever published the photograph, Imagine having a child in the middle of a class of about 30 to 40 children doing that on his own. You see, he could have really had a really nasty cut on his head. So that's why I say always teach them to saw using putting their wood in a vice. And at first, I would just, I myself supervise you know, several children learning to saw at a time. In fact, I've often had a, a carpentry shop, as it were, a, a hut put up in the yard, which was big enough to hold about 10, 12 children, and uh, all the right places for the tools. You know. And then we, we would have times when we went there and really did carpentry series. Not that I'm so hot at carpentry, but you know, everybody can keep a head of a five-year-old, can't they? <laughs> <laughs> and then you would teach them to sew. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Is that three and a half to four? I mean, they love to have needle and thread. They love to begin learning to sew on buttons. You see, again, in the old days, by five, six years of age, a girl sewed beautifully. 
In all our homes, we have the most wonderful samplers. They always work these samplers with the different embroidery stitches and so on. And these will have the child's name on, so-and-so, age six, so-and-so, age seven. We have one at home, which is an apple tree and Adam and Eve and the snake going up and the alphabet and all sorts of stitches. I mean, I don't think any of us could do it. And it says, Mary, so-and-so, age seven. And uh, if they, at this time, they're not so interested in finishing things. They like the techniques. They learn to sew on buttons. They like to sew on dozens of buttons, you know. They're not uh, interested in finishing things. <coughs> but again, you must be careful because a needle can be pretty lethal, you know. And you always sit a child uh, at a table by himself. They can sit opposite, but they can't sit side by side because the child sews like this at first. <laughs> yes. I actually knew an adult who had, had lost the sight of one eye by sitting too near a child when they were sewing at school. You see? So I, I, I'm really careful there, time. So anyway. And of course, in the garden, they, uh, you should have a garden where they can grow things and learn to dig and um, plant seeds. You have to plant things that are fairly quick growing, you know. If you're going to grow anything, it's something quick like radishes and mustard and cress that comes up quickly. And, uh, it's hard for them to go out and look for every day and nothing has come up, you know grow plants and herbs and flowers and vegetables. So that's a, that certainly, I think, is part of, part of the practical life. All right, then. So I suggest you make a list of things that you do in your homes, because like the broom, we have differences. Yeah. And I see you doing things in your houses, and I would do them a different way in England. Um, that's what's so exciting, you see. Very often my foreign students have brought me the brooms from their country. I've got an African one, which is a sort of bunch of <coughs> sticks, and it's got a very ornamental pattern woven into the handle. And of course, it's only about this long, so you have to bend over when you sweep. And in India, they were using the same type of broom, just a handful of twigs, which they would bend over and choose. And uh, they had no idea of dusting. And Dr. Mom saw I lived in India and wanted to have a uh, uh, girl who did the cleaning to dust. This girl could not comprehend dusting. And she was quite unable to teach her to dust, so she had to dust her own room every day. They have quite a way. So that's what's exciting about traveling in each country. You see things done in a different way. So you have to teach whatever is done in your own country. So I can't really teach you. In arranging the practical life on the shelves in the room for the children, uh, would you put the cleaners like on trays with something like what the particular cleaner is used for? Or how are the, like, the cleaning and polishing? As nearly as possible in the way you would store them in your own house. Certain things you keep by the sink, don't you? So that the washing up, the cleaning, and uh, something like you use Vim, do you? What you use as a scouring powder? Something like that. Don't you always keep those at the side of the sink? And any container, really if you want the brass polishing things all together. I find uh, an, uh, an attractive box as good as anything, perhaps a wooden box. Uh, we, in, in England, uh, the housemaid always had a, a wooden box with a handle, you see, and a tray that she kept all these things in. And the, the nicest thing was when I made small ones in wood, um, but I didn't make the tray with a handle and the brass polishing was in this one and the silver polishing in the next and uh, every day I saw that they were clean cloths you know ready if anyone wanted it 
those were the nicest, I think, because they, for us they were the most natural things. The children saw them used at home. What did you do with actual house cleaning while the children were there? If the windows are dusty, did the teacher be dusty? Oh, I think it's important that the adults go, join in. And it's very important that you enjoy it. You see, it's so sad for the children. You always know if you have children who don't come to you till five or six, and those of them who have already learned that work is a burden, practically always have mothers who complain about the housework. And they'll come to school and they'll say to you, poor mummy, she has to cook the dinner. You say, oh, poor mummy, she has to clean the dining room today. You see, and therefore they grow, by that time they have developed this attitude that all work is something to be avoided. So it's very important to have parents at home who do any chores as though they did enjoy them. And then you win because the children all want to help you. And as they grow up into young people, they do it cheerfully alongside you. So, yes, <laughs> it's for nothing else. But you know, there's nothing as nice as having a cheerful person in the house, is there? I wouldn't, I'm sure I would divorce if I had a wife who grumbled every evening when I came home, <laughs> you know, about the housework. And really, it's a, I think it's a very nice occupation, you know, keeping a house looking nice. Yes, with all the modern things you have, it doesn't take that long. I think it's partly we don't know how to do it because of this lack of training. So it's very important the teacher enjoys it, and when you have this spring cleaning day, you do it alongside the children, you see, and so on. Oh, would you do shoe polishing? Uh, yes, they can polish their own shoes. If you are really sure, you see, so many shoes are not polished today, are they? That's what I was going to ask. You let them do their own, or would you provide some? You know, they can. Would you have some on the shelf that they can do? Well, you must really watch because you see, I mean, if a child was to have those suede shoes and polish them, they would ruin the shoes. You see. We used to, all the children with us always used to wear leather shoes. And then you only had to provide the black and the brown polish and show them how to stuff their shoe full of newspaper so they didn't get polish all over the Sometimes inside. Sometimes they want to do mine, so they have some, well, not today, but <laughs> if they have some that they can't do their own, I let them do mine, but I, is that okay? Do some of else's shoes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's okay. Well, I, I think I would keep the shoe cleaning material out of reach show them how to do it. And if it's out of reach, if they come and ask to do it, then you look at their shoes before giving it to them and you explain to them, oh, well, you're wearing the kind of shoes today that we have to brush and we don't uh, polish. So. Oh yes, they often come and ask to polish yours. Somebody else's too. Well, they want to do somebody else's shoe. Oh, that's fine, provided you do make sure it's a shoe that needs polishing. Otherwise, you're in trouble, aren't you? <laughs> All right now, so you're going to have that short break. <laughs>